Yeah, no, go on, go on. Okay. I'll start. You'll stop, we'll start with you. Because um, I noticed in, in that you didn't get through that kind of Guinness in that interview, I was looking <laughs> continuity, it just stayed there. So that's a new Trust me, it's not finished. <laughs> um, I, I was watching, you know, watching the clips of you play and I saw you play myself. Uh, did, did it affect the way, did your status as a black player affect the way you played as well? Did, did it give you, you mentioned the, the being central defenders, did it give you a certain uh, way of carrying yourself as, a, as an athlete, as a player, as a personality? Um, I used to get racist abuse every game. Um, when I was playing at home, it was more, it was less, because obviously playing at home and you've got your own fans that would fill the majority of the stadium, but every single away game got it. And what I did was, there's, there's certain ways that people react to certain things in life. On, on that racism from, I always, Use that negativity and turned it into positivity. So it inspired me to play better in the game, not to make mistakes, because if I made a mistake, I was going to get slaughtered. So I turned it into that positivity, knowing that the more they chanted, the better I was playing. So I sort of went through my career, and that was always a premise on the football pitch. It, it's, it's fantastic to talk about it now, you talk about Cyril Regis, uh, and there was Cyril, and there was Vin Anderson for Knox Forest and for, and for England. Was there someone to talk to about this at the time? I mean, now you can talk about it, but I, I don't think 70s Britain was great on mental health, or particularly with aspects of race. So you bottled all this up and channeled it in there? Well, I like to think that I let it out on the pitch <laughs> when I was tackling it. A certain centre forward who felt it up there. Correct. But um, no, not really. It was um, a situation where there was nobody to talk to apart from the more black players that came in, there was like a fraternity. So you could talk to the others in charity? We, we talked to each other, but that wasn't solving anything because you know, we with us talking as footballers about the racist abuse we're getting every week wasn't changing anything. And, and, and did you speak with, with Cyril Regis and, uh, and Vin Anderson? Well, look, and even, even when youngsters were coming through, like Ian Wright and people like that, John Barnes. So we all, we all, Try to pass down that pattern, but the reality is, um, it's not our, it's not our fight. We can't fight, and we can't change. We, we can influence, and that's it. I guess with results and the way you, and the way you yes. play. Uh, Darren, obviously, you've examined this in, in, in a lot of detail. It's been the inspiration for your for your series. Do you feel that you know we have, we have kick it out now as a, as a as a campaign? But it's been around for a long, long time. Brendan Bats and all that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Felt like one of my tackles. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, and, and George mentions it there. But then, a bit, it's being talked about now. I mean, I don't know how, you know, this is quite an unusual series to be talking about this thing. I don't, people didn't know about Eddie Paris. I didn't, I know. Are you finding as you were making it, as you're going along, that you're that it's still a sensitive issue or that people are now, we are in a spot that, that talking about it is helping. I think, I think it's hard to judge how, how much progress has been made. I mean, I do think what we were trying to do with, with the series was really be led by what the players told us. So, so it wasn't, a, a, you know, there's an anti-racist element to it, but it was also really important to just hear what George had to say and, and to, we talked about the sort of the joy and pain of, of his career uh, and sometimes I think black players are either talked about with no mention of, of racism that they, they're subjected to, or they're put in a position where they have to be ambassadors for anti-racism, when in fact, first and foremost, they're elite athletes. Um, and I think what we tried to do was, was just listen to those life stories. Um, but yeah, it, it's really, 
it became apparent that for, for George, there wasn't a sort of network of support. That those players, you know, in, in that era that I was watching as a kid, weren't able to sort of say to their employers, hang on, you've got a duty of care here. You know, I'm getting sort of racial abuse, sometimes death threats from, from thousands of people. Uh, you're paying my wages, you should be keeping me safe. That just wasn't part of the conversation. And I think sometimes we forget that, those of us who weren't around in that era, that story isn't being told. And I think it's important to recognise that and to recognise the kind of sacrifices that had to be made to be not only an elite athlete, but, but to actually, you know, be subjected to that whilst doing your job. I mean, I, I, I literally can't imagine what that must be like. Uh, maybe people must have experienced racism, small and microaggressions, we call them, like, throughout. But to have thousands of people chanting at you, I, I, I'm amazed that you sort of could go, could go through it. Carry on, John Barnes as well with the, the famous banana back heel, you know, how... How to, how to bat that off, obviously, with your performances, you do it and standing here and being inspirational, but it is extraordinary to go through it. Um, like I said, it's just went through it because it was your job and you, you're doing a sport that you loved, you wanted to play, and that came along at that time with the territory. And that's it, I mean, I've played against West Ham and they were brutal. When I said uh, they, oh, they were one of the worst uh, fans for racial abuse, West Ham and Millwall. And uh, funny enough, ladies, in fact, all of them. <laughs> but the, um, I played against West Ham and um, I got thrown celery. You know, John Barnes got thrown the banana. Yeah. I got celery, you know, like if I had five stores. And all of a sudden, this celery came over the barrier, and I went, Celery? I, I don't, this, is this a really posh area? Because I'm not getting the celery. I understand bananas, I get that, but a celery, it must have just come back from little. <laughs> you get to ask straight to the game. Ask you get hummus, and, and, <laughs> yeah, hummus. And quinoa chips. <laughs> uh, Vicky, just, uh, bringing you in here as the director of uh, of, of this. Uh, I know in the third episode we talked a, a, we talk about Wendy, the, the, the female uh, aspect of uh, football. Did you, as a director, do you is this something that was you know uh, for you uh, as a documentary maker trying to get to the to the number of the question, was it very easy to sort of find out what that is and you have to kind of edit and, and make sure you're sort of dispassionate in a way? Uh, we spent a lot of time going over the structure and the stories. Obviously there was a lot of team meetings and stuff for gathering, research. There's a whole team, like this was a massive team effort. Like I was on every shoot, but there was people back at the office that were researching. Even in the edit, I had Luke Andrews and Luke Daly helping me. Luke Daly was amazing with writing the series with Darren and myself, so it was a big team effort. But yeah, we did a lot of prep before, but even with all that prep, there was still loads to do after we finished shooting, because, I mean, I, I think that the magic happens in the edit. I think that's where you find, like, even if you've done your research, a lot of the time the story will change in the edit anyway. But telling Eddie's story was probably the hardest because obviously he's not with us anymore. And our closest relation, uh, she died a few years before we made this, but luckily she knew Liz McBride, so she passed on all this stuff. And yeah, we were wary of the type of voices we were gonna use to tell that story because we didn't want just a lot of white people who never met him to be telling this story. But I think the voices we found Perfect, because Armand and Liz, even though they never met him, they they have stories, they have links to him. It wasn't just two people we plucked out of. Yeah. So did you have any personal um, sort of relationships with his story? Obviously, Darren said he grew up watching, you know, watching the Swansea. Uh, not really, not like a personal like. Obviously, I'm white, so I don't have that like link to like racism. But I am gay, so. I've had my fair share of prejudice as have people in my community, so 
anything I can use my talent in filmmaking to help tell stories and celebrate stories as well. I think I see this as a celebration story. I don't see it as like an anti-racist story. I see it as yes, there are there is that in there, but like Uzo said, this is a celebration of those people, like giving them the microphone to tell their story. Yeah. I think it's important. I think I think a, a, a documentary about gay footballers were that ever to happen in the male game. Because there isn't one apparently. <laughs> uh, that would be a fac- that would be a fascinating thing. But it's Maybe a very similar. Day. Well, it'd be a very similar level of abuse. I think I would probably present prevent it. You you go through, you've been through so much. But imagine the first out gay footballer uh, that we had in rugby. I think uh, you had one. I think with Mr. Bin one. It's a, it's a slightly different conversation, but going through it, it, it feels, as you say, quite quite similar. Um, we're showing the women's World Cup final here. Uh, tomorrow, it's quite a big decision. Quite, quite excited uh, about it. Uh, I haven't seen the episode with Wendy. Um, but, uh, how she, how, how, how do the Welsh, how do Welsh footballers feel about uh, the lionesses? So, so when I spoke with Wendy, she, she actually brought up the the lionesses, you know, the the Euro victory, and and her view was that it, it was doing a lot for the game in England, but also in Scotland and in Wales. And I think where, where women's football is at the moment, it's, it's about raising that profile, uh, about making sure that you know media is given the coverage. But Wendy was very concerned also with the, the, the sort of grassroots issues of whether players have decent medical facilities, whether they can you know do do all this, get all the sort of support that they need to, to play the game. So yeah, she was she was very sort of positive about that, whilst being proud as a, as a you know a Wales captain and coach. Uh, George, this top is fantastic. This, is this an original? No, unfortunately, it's not my original. Um, but I was reunited with this top on the shoe. And by the way, Vicky, is, she was brilliant. On that day, it was one of the best days I've had in my life, seriously. He started a bit early and finished a bit late. <laughs> she wanted to film more and we were like, no, like, this is it's it. It's too dark. <laughs> no, it was, a, it was a great, and it, and like we were saying, it was about telling our story rather than making a point. So that was really, really good. And do you wear this all the time? I mean, I've, I've got... now, now that I've been re- reunited with it. Right, have you watched it? Yeah, uh, no, no, I haven't, to be fair. <laughs> you well, know, I, I've got it, and, I've, I mean, and to be fair, I thought to myself, you know, it's got to be worn, and Darren said, you've got to wear it, otherwise I'm not giving it to you. So uh, it was a present from Darren, and, uh, you know. Well, um, what of your career have you kept mementos, apart from the scars? Well, I, had, I was, unfortunately, um, I uh, got burgled, so I have my Welsh caps, the kit. When we went to to the camp for the for the training before a, a, an international fixture, they used to give us our kit, and we had it all numbered up and everything. It was just great, but we had to give it back. I nicked mine. <laughs> I thought, I'm not coming all the way here. I'm not taking my training kit back. This is the national team, you know. This is, this is the ultimate for a player to represent his country is the pinnacle. And uh, you can't ever take that away. But, so I got burgled and my caps went, all the training kit, everything. So. Uh, Darren reunited me with this top and, I've, and I said, I'm having it. So if anyone sees someone running around in a dirty, unwashed training kit from 1978. <laughs> with, a, with a number 16 on it. <laughs> we know it's important to. <laughs> um, who was the, we saw, I saw you play with Paul, uh, Paul Mariner, uh, uh, in marking him at, it, it there, he was an Arsenal and Ipswich player. Who was the best footballer you, you played with and against? That's a very difficult question, I've got to be honest with you. I think playing against um, 
Billy Whitehurst, I don't know if anybody knows, he was, his family were Doncaster Mafia and he was hard. And he either, you know, he gave as good as he got. But <laughs> that was just a strength thing. Um, but then if you look at people like Kenny Dalgleish, Ian Rush played against him. Um, I think with you, Ian Rush as well. Yeah. But against him at Liverpool, they were great players. I could, uh, Mark and Kenny Dalglish, that's so difficult. He was a bit naughty, actually, Kenny was. He used to like to feel you. And then, as the ball was coming into the thing, he would stamp on your foot. Really? Yeah. I thought he was that's a what, boy. So then you had the problem of the pain in your foot and going to close him down when he's getting the ball. But don't worry, I knew the dark arts, so <laughs> it, didn't, it, it didn't get away with that many, many times. Fantastic, and you, and you won the League Cup with uh, Andy Gray scoring, uh, presumably. Yes, Andy Gray, he scored. Um, Emily News was the centre half next to me. Crazy. Great Liverpool legend. But funny enough, he was, it was the only trophy he didn't win at Liverpool was the League Cup. And then he came to us, and that season we won the League Cup against Forest, two of the European champions, and won the trophy the last two years. At Wembley? Yeah, at Wembley. Fantastic. It doesn't, it doesn't get much better than that. Although I imagine debuting in your first film at Green Man comes pretty close. <laughs> to be fair, it's, it's more nerve wracking than walking through that tunnel, I've got to be honest with you. That's what we are. Well, look, we are delighted that you came. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Um, it was very, very If they do want to see, if they want to see, of course you want to see the next uh, episodes of it, just remind them where they can catch up with the, the rest of Dragon on my shirt. Yeah, so it's on the FAW platform Red Wall Plus. You can either get the app, the Red Wall uh, Plus app, or you can just go on redwallplus.com. Give your I think it's Dot Wales. Sorry? Dot Wales. Dot Wales, sorry. Come on, Red Darren. Dot <laughs> Wales. Um, and you just give your email and you can sign in and see all the content there and all five episodes. I really hope you do. The Wendy Riley episode is fantastic as well. And uh, do join us for the Women's World Cup final tomorrow in football. What's your thing? George Berry, Darren Chetty. Thank you very much.